Good. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rajoshi Chaudhary, and uh, I lead the data science team at Book My Show, which is the number one uh, entertainment platform for India. I think all of you would have used Book My Show at some point or your uh, other in your life, whether you are booking for movies, live events, or anything. You would have probably seen a section like, say, recommended movies for you, or maybe uh, some section like you may also like it. In fact, if you look at any of the widgets, whether it's on the home page or the events home page, all of them are powered from the data science team and the personalization team. So that's where we work over here. <coughs> and today uh, we'll be learning about recommendations. So, are you familiar with recommendations? Anyone over here? So uh, all of us have interacted with recommendations at some point or other in their life. So take for example, uh, you're reaching home after a hard day of work and you're very hungry. You decide to fire up your favorite food delivery app. And while you're scrolling through the endless list of dishes that are there, you're thinking that what should you get for tonight? Should you settle for your favorite comfort food or do you want to try something a bit more adventurous tonight? At that point, you notice a new widget that has been presented, curated dishes for you. And at the very top, you look, there's a new dish of ramen from a newly opened restaurant nearby. You have always wanted to try ramen for a while, maybe because you have seen it on many of your animes that you have watched or any mangas that you have read. But anyways, you settle for ordering ramen tonight. After having your dinner, you want to watch a Netflix show. But there are so many choices to choose from. Which one do you want or how do you want to select through? You're not in the mood for drama. You already had enough at office today for it. And <laughs> you have already caught up to all your favorite comedy shows. While you're resigning to the fact that you might have to watch a rerun of your old show, you notice something in the corner, an obscure comedy series in the recommended for you section. You make your selection and settle for tonight. Now, what do all of this have in common? All of these are recommended systems in action. And today we'll be learning more about such systems. Specifically, we'll be looking at what are recommendation systems? Why do we need recommendation systems? Do they even help us over here? And how do we go about building our recommendation system? What's the general architecture that we look at? Then we'll look at some of the algorithms that are used while you're building recommendation systems. For example, how do you select candidates? How do you identify that which content should we show to our users? How do we go about filtering those content? How do we score them? How do you select those? And how do you re-rank those items? So this is a brief overview of what we'll be covering today. So let's get on to what are recommendation systems. Would anyone like to take a stab or try to define what are recommendation systems? There are no wrong answers over here. So you can just take a stab at it. Like a recommendation system is like a, if I am uh, on book my show, hmm. if I am seeing on uh, completely on EDMs or any DJ parties or something, then the book my show only shows the that part about related to that part. Like uh, if edition uh, EDM is going on in Mumbai right now, hmm. so any future events of Edisher, Asher, and all uh, marshmallow and everything. Yeah, Bookmasher will show that only. Right. On the front page. That's very good. Any other definition? It's your study. Correct. It's analyzed your previous data text that you have previously watched or wanted to watch or have shown enough time on that. It recommends on your front page or anywhere. That you can see. Correct. So all of these are basically, uh, we are talking about some algorithms or techniques to actually identify what we should show to a user. We want to show some content to a user that we think they're going to be most interested in. So if I show it to them, for example, we have two widgets over here, the recommended movies one and the similar to what you have booked before. We want to be specific that if we are showing Ed Sheeran at the front, you actually want to see Ed Sheeran or you want to book for it. So that's where your recommendation systems come into play. Now, why do you think we need recommendation systems? You can just, I mean, you can just look up any events over there. What's the need for having recommendation systems? To increase the number of users uh, 
in their event or maybe the number of registrations to maximize the hiring yeah. that's good uh, discovery is an important aspect that recommendations aim to cover over there uh, let's tackle it from another viewpoint uh, consider you are uh, browsing on youtube which has billions of videos over there if you want to look for something that's of your interest it's going to take very long for you to actually identify over there that hey um, do we have any anime fans or manga fans over here all right uh, suppose you want to uh, you have watched jujutsu kaisen and you want to see that hey is there any something similar that's been uh, available this season so how do you go about it if you want to see through the billions of videos that will take a lot of time it will also spoil your user experience over there what recommendation systems aim to do is help you assist over there we want to show you content that you have interacted with or you have browsed before earlier so when we show that to you it helps or enhances your user experience and later once you have a good feeling about it you are more likely to come on the app it increases the user engagement on the app when the user engagement increases it's more likely that you will keep transacting or using this app that's why we are talking about the user retention those users are more likely to use the app for example if you keep seeing the content that you're interested in maybe you are a comedy show fan and if we keep showing you comedy shows in the top 3 or 5 places you're more likely to just select over here because you know that whenever i fire up the app i will definitely see my favorite content so that's where uh, recommendation systems come in they help enhance the user experience they increase the engagement over there and at the end you also drive your business value or revenue because when you show relevant content to the user it increases the satisfaction and they will keep in, uh, engaging with the app in fact uh, a lot of tech companies have their primary source of revenue through recommendations around 30 to 40% of them can be attributed to the recommendations that are shown on the app so let's uh, talk about a general architecture like uh, if we want to go about designing a recommendation system what it would look like if we uh, take for example youtube you have got billions of videos and if you want to apply a ranking algorithm to it it's not feasible or economically viable that you sort through billions of videos to actually identify the uh, items that you want to show to the user what we do first is you go through a phase called candidate generation out of this billions of videos you want to identify the top 100000 items or videos that the user is likely to be interested in once you have shortlisted that next you go to ranking over here you apply a more specific approach out of the hundreds or thousands that are there which are the ones that i want to show at the very top you score or rank those videos over there after you have scored over there there can be other factors also for example if a, the user has earlier interacted or seen similar videos but they have disliked it then i can remove them from the ranking similarly you want to show fresh content to the users suppose a, a video has recently released you want to show it at the very top take for example movies that come up you would see that the freshly or newly released movies are at the very front of the recommendation widget and how if you have interacted with it earlier you would see that suppose you have booked for dune 2 you have already watched our movie you won't see that item in a recommendation widget why because it's not relevant to you it's highly unlikely that you'll again book for it so that's where the ranking part comes into play and then we show the results to the users so uh once you have the algorithm in place the next thing that you need to understand is how are we evaluating this algorithm if we are showing these videos how good is the ranking quality that we have so there are few metrics that we can use over here uh, i think you would be pretty familiar with some of them for example you might be using root mean square error in some of your regression algorithms that are there you have the mean average error that's there so those are some accuracy metrics that you can use apart from that you even have some metrics that measure your ranking quality for example if i have 10 movies in a recommendation widget and if the first relevant movie is at the fourth position that widget is not very useful to the user 
ideally you would expect that widget the movie to be at the very top of the widget so here you have the ranking metrics that you can use you can use something like mrr that actually looks at the first relevant metric that you have similarly ndcg is a metric that evaluates the whole widget that's there you look at what's the quality of the recommendations in this entire widget that's there instead of just settling for a single movie at that point finally precision and recall are something that you are already familiar with in your regular uh, machine learning systems what does precision at can recall at came in we are looking at the top key items that we are showing so recommendation systems of widgets show you a limited number of items say your top 10 items to help you make an easier decision so we are looking at say if you have 10 items over there precision at 10 or recall at 10 what's the precision or recall of the items that we are seeing over there then finally there are something like business metrics also that you look at you look at that how much is the user engaging with the widget you look at what's the click through rate that is there so for example if the user is just viewing through the widgets but not clicking that indicates that the widget is not very helpful to the user so that's a click through rate that comes final is the conversion how many users are viewing and how many users have transacted so that's a good measure of actually uh, estimating how well your model is working so now uh, let's deep dive into uh, how candidate generation works over here so let's take an example of movies that we have primarily uh, there are few categories of algorithms that we use one is collaborative filtering that's there the second is content based filtering let's start with uh, collaborative filtering first suppose uh, i usually all of you would have gone to movies with your friends right you usually go in your group and often it happens that for example uh, say you're watching a marvel movie with a friend but the next time your friend has watched another dc movie or something he usually would recommend to you hey this is a very good movie you should go and watch you know you can trust his recommendation because you are you both have similar tastes so that's what collaborative filtering tries to emulate over here what we are doing is we are identifying similar users then we'll look at what movies have those users watched for example if we know that user a and user b are similar users and user b has watched some movies which user a hasn't then we know that we can show those movies to user a because it's likely that he would be interested in that the other part is content based filtering what happens in content based filtering is that we are solely focusing on you as the user we are not looking at the other users at this point so for example if you are watching more of marvel movies it's highly likely that we'll look at hey which other movies are similar to marvel movies that are currently releasing and then we will release this uh, when i will uh, recommend this movies to you someone uh, suggested that uh, we we'll look at historical and behavioral data that's present over there so we use those attributes of the movie so it can be the genre that you are looking at it can be the artists that are there it can be your directors it can even be the synopsis that you are using over there basis on this uh, movie attributes you decide that hey movie a is similar to movie b and hence we can recommend movie b to this user the third part is uh, sometimes when you are browsing on say uh, a e-commerce platform you might often see that you are recommended some items which you might also never have tr transacted for before for example if you are buying eggs and bread it's possible that they would recommend milk to you even though you have not transacted for it ever before why that's happening over here the algorithm is trying to predict in this session what's the most likely item that this user will purchase so if someone is looking for some items for breakfast the algorithm knows that hey eggs bread and milk go together we have seen users pur purchasing similar group of items before so if this user is purchasing eggs and bread it's highly likely that we will also purchase milk so for this session let us show him milk so those type of recommendations are called session based recommendations those are something that you're looking at a very short term over there whereas this are looking at a more longer term interest it can be over years that you're transacting or browsing over netflix what you would see for example when you're watching some shows it will gradually build up a user profile over weeks and months whereas session based recommendation is only for that instant that it's looking at 
Now, uh, all of these algorithms work on the primary basis of defining how do we uh, encode or represent these features. Uh, I think uh, Augustine already covered some facts like embeddings earlier when you were looking at uh, LLM models over there. So think for example, when you are building a movie recommendation system, what are the features that would go into it? You would probably think of genre, artist or synopsis. All of these are textual based features. Whereas your ML models understand numeric features. There are two ways you can convert a textual feature to a numeric feature. One, if you look at something like genres, where they are uh, discreetly placed, you can encode them. You can apply a one hot encoding or something. So for example, let us take an example of these four movies that are there. And we're looking at two types of genres, action and romance. We are trying to identify on a scale of uh, zero to five, how much of this is an uh, action movie. For example, if I look at Dark Knight, you can probably relate that it's a strong action movie. You wouldn't associate it with a romantic movie at that point. So you have a five over there for action and a zero for romance over there. So this is something where you are encoding it. You are identifying some attributes to how you can represent that movie. And similarly, we have done it for all of our other movies. For example, you have Love Actually, The Hunger Games and Catching Fire. All of these have some kind of representation built over there on how we are defining this movie. And in fact, you can even extend it to others. For example, you can even incorporate artists, directors, and even synopsis. What happens in synopsis, we build something called as word embeddings. I think you probably would have heard about it. Chat GPT and all uses usually word embeddings that are there. What word embedding does is it gets a numeric representation of your words. And how is it different from here? When you look at action or romance, these are isolated over there. You can't usually have a semantic relationship over there. How would you relate action and romance? Whereas suppose you are encoding king and queen, you can associate there some kind of semantic relationship. Do they belong to nobility over there? Let's consider uh, Dark Knight over here. You can probably associate it with uh, maybe judges, prosecutors, vigilant, something that relates to the criminal justice system. So it captures that semantic relationship over there. So that's how word embeddings work. So those are two related but separate types of representations on how you can build them. Now uh, we'll go a bit deeper into how the mathematics of it works to better understand how the further algorithms uh, interact or work together. So let's consider action and romance that we are plotting along each of the axes. You would have probably uh, studied uh, about this a bit in your high school, how axes work. So we are just as co considering this as the x coordinates and the y coordinates are there. Uh, we have plotted all the four movies on this graph. And what you can see over here is some of those movies are pretty close to each other. For example, you have Catching Fire and Hunger Games, which are nested pretty closely. Whereas Love Actually and Dark Knight are pretty far apart. Why do you think that might be happening? Correct. Uh, Dark Knight lies at one end of the spectrum of action, whereas Love Actually is on the other end of romance. So those are polar opposites. Whereas Catching Fire and Hunger Games, those are sequels of our same series. So they are tended to be clustered together. This notion of closeness that you have, that how similar are particular items, is something that we define using a similarity measure. A similarity measure is nothing but a function that takes two items and tries to get a scalar representation of how close they are. There are various functions that you can use for similarity measure. One of the easiest ones is calculating the Euclidean distance. So over here, uh, you can actually visually see that how far these are and get a notion ki hey, these are not relevant. Whereas we can also use vectors for them. Uh, I think some of you might be familiar with vectors uh, during your uh, undergraduate or JWA. What happens in vectors is consider them from the origin that we are considering a vector. And we can consider two things. One is the dot product that's there. The second is the cosine similarity. Yep. 
the dot product is nothing but mathematically it's the product of the length of the vector and the angle between them so what happens in that case is it's heavily influenced by the length of the vector whereas if you just want to focus on the act uh, the angle or the direction that it is in you can just look at the cosine similarity that's over here so see for example uh, we have love actually and dark knight we know there's a dissimilar so you have an angle of 90 degree over here whereas if you look at catching fire and hunger games those are at an angle of 10 degrees over here an easy way of calculating uh, the dot product is just to take the multiplication of both the items and adding them up for example if we want to calculate the similarity of uh, the hunger games and catching fire what you would do is you would multiply 4 into 4 plus 2 into 3 whereas if you want to calculate the similarity between dark knight and love actually you will multiply 5 into 0 plus 0 into 5 which will be giving you 0 it's a uh, non-negative integer that you are given so this is uh, the basics of how the similarity measures work next we were looking at some of the candidate generation algorithms that are over here so let's start with content based filtering now uh, for any uh, recommendation systems to work it's important for us to understand the user because only after understanding the user you can recommend some items to them how do we go about understanding the users you look at their past history their transaction history that's there you look at their behavioral profile what trailers they have watched have they marked this movie as interested have they viewed the synopsis page have they checked the seat layout those are some minor factors that indicate if they are interested for that movie and we built up something called as a uh, user representation over here so at the bottom that you see we have our user vivek and we have seen that he is someone who is very interested in action and thriller movies so for the sake of simplicity we have a one over there and zero uh, otherwise consider that we have five uh, five we have six movies over here which we want to recommend to our users these are some of the attributes that we have identified for these movies we have looked at some of the genres like action romance animation and thriller and then what happens in content based filtering is once you have identified the movie attributes once we have identified the user attributes then we take a simple dot product of them so for example if i look at vivek and batman begins if I were to take the dot product of it, I will be doing first the action column 1 into 1. Next, we have zeros in romance and animation. And finally, the thriller one. That will give me a total of 2. Whereas if I look at Twilight over there, you have a 0 into 1 for the first column, which indicates it's a mismatch. Second, you have romance, which is also 0. And finally, a uh, thriller also. So the net dot product that you are getting is a zero. So if we look closely out of the dot products, we can see that we can recommend the Batman Begins and Dark Knight to, the, to our user. Now, what are some advantages that you think could be of this approach? Sir, I have so we would definitely consider them so the identity the goal of this algorithm is to identify candidates that we are selecting the ranking stage comes at the later part suppose you have two similar uh, movies that are getting the same score over here we'll next move to a furthermore refined approach on which movie we should surface at the top we we'll look at some of those algorithms also that if we are getting a similar score over here, how do we rank them? That would come in the scoring and uh, re-ranking part of the presentation. So what happens in content-based filtering is since we are just focusing on a single user at a time, we can even make many niche recommendations. For example, a lot of folks might not be watching uh, animes over here. But if our user is someone who is a huge anime buff, we know his past history and we can look at similar anime movies that are there so we can recommend those type of movies the drawback to this approach is this is very focused on the user's current interest for example our user might also like comedy in this uh, category but since we are not 
surfacing those kind of recommendations, our user might never even know that he could like those types of movies. So that's a drawback of this approach. To overcome this, we also look at another approach that's content-based filtering, uh, collaborative filtering, sorry. So a collaborative filtering also works on a similar way. We look at a user interaction matrix. So uh, consider, for example, we have four users on our rows over here. And we have five movies that they have given some kind of rating for on a zero on a scale of one to five. How likely that they like this movie? Now, from this interaction matrix, you can actually see that we can uh, uncover several patterns, whether it's of a user behavior, whether even if it's of a movie behavior. For example, if we look at our first and third users you can see that they've given some kind of a similar ratings for all our movies. Basis this, we can postulate that this users share some kind of similar preferences. Maybe both of them like action movies, or maybe both of them like k ramas Who knows? But this kind of patterns is something that we can uncover from a user interaction matrix. This matrix contains both your user preferences and your item uh, attributes over here. Another interesting uh, factor that you can uncover is if you look at the last three users, you would notice that the sum of the second and the third users ratings is what you're getting in the fourth one. What can we interpret from this? Maybe your first, the second user likes action movies and your third user likes comedy. Your last user is someone who likes both of these genres. So that's why he has a composite rating like that. Let's look at how it works for movies. Uh, consider uh, Marvel movies. You have uh, Spider-Man. You have uh, various sequels over there. Electro comes. Uh, you have got uh, correct. So even those, if they are not the same movies, they share some similar aspects. They are set in the same multiverse that's there. They have similar uh, kind of action or thriller that's there. So you can expect that users who are similar would give some kind of similar ratings for those movies. That's why over here uh, we have M1 and M4. Our users have given similar ratings for them. So you have got Mall Cop and Observe and Report. Another thing is uh, these movies can also be a combined feature. For example, uh, if we look at M2, M3 and M5, if you consider M5, you'll see that it's kind of an average of both M2 and M3. It could be, for example, your one uh, movie is Twister, which has some aspects of disaster over there. Your second movie is Jaws, which has sharks and some horror genres over there. The final one is Sharknado, which has both of these attributes of features built in. That's why you're seeing some kind of a relationship over there. The goal in collaborative filtering is to uncover these relationships. You want to extract these features and not depend upon it manually. In content-based filtering, we were manually annotating that, hey, this is action, this is romance. We are manually selecting these features. What if we could automate all of them? You don't want to depend on that or scale it to say on the scale of YouTube, which does for billions of videos. Do you think it's manually feasible for everyone to sit and annotate that what's going on over there? So you look at some more sophisticated models that are there. So uh, that's where collaborative filtering comes in. And a very popular feature of collaborative filtering is matrix factorization. What happens in matrix factorization, you have your interaction uh, matrix that's there, which was our ratings that we saw earlier. You decompose it into your user preferences, which is your user matrix, and your item features, which is your item matrix. This would correspond to uh, the user metrics would be our user Vivek in content-based filtering. And the movie factors would be the uh, top metrics that we had seen earlier. Now, uh, some of the popular approaches for decomposing this would be SVD or ALS, which is singular value decomposition and uh, alternating least squares. What happens in this is we are trying to optimize giving these two uh, matrices. If you multiply them, we should get back our original metrics. So we are trying to optimize first, we optimize the user metrics, we get some numbers for them, some representation. Next, we optimize your movie factors, you get another representation. So you oscillate from optimizing one to the other until finally you arrive at your ratings again. 
let's take uh, let's revisit our earlier example so on the left hand side you can see what our user uh, representations could possibly look like here we have looked at comedy and action as our two features in actual when you are actually uh, using matrix factorization they might not actually relate to some uh, features that you have over here because we are using latent features over there those are some underlying uh, features or variables that are there which you cannot uh, easily relate to it can be probably represent some legal aspects that are over there it can be probably represents to a historical documentary over there so you can't associate that the first column is comedy the second com column is action for the sake of simplicity we have considered these two features as comedy and action but how the matrix factorization works is we are looking at user a we are looking that uh, he has a one over in comedy and a zero in action this indicates that a user loves comedy movies similarly when you look at the movies uh, embeddings or on the top from m1 to m5 we have something on a similar scale so we have rated them from 1 to 5 where 3 uh, for m1 means that it lies somewhere in the middle for our comedy uh, spectrum and now if you see if we multiply this two matrices we'll get back our original ratings matrix so take for example a user a that's there we multiply both the comedy columns 1 into 3 plus the action columns 0 into 1 that would give us back 3 similarly uh, if we consider a user d and we look at m4 over there so 1 into 3 plus 1 into 1 will give you back 4 over here now once we have identified and got our user representations and uh, movie representations what's next how do we actually use this to recommend to our users so the next stage is you want to identify the similar users we already saw that how we can represent our users or movies on a graph we have something similar over here we have plotted our features across both the axes comedy on one and action on the other we have also represented two of our users user d and user a over here and we have also identified some of the movies that they have seen earlier for example we can see that user d has watched m1 and user a has watched m1 m2 m1 m3 and m4 now what happens over here is we see that both of them have watched m1 but we also notice that m3 and m4 is something that user a liked so we are highly confident that if we show this to our user d a user d would also love this movies most probably will also book for them so this is how collaborative filtering works on a high level now uh, take a moment and think what could be the advantages of this approach we looked at content based filtering earlier and we are looking at collaborative filtering now so what are some advantages and disadvantages of this approach over here Correct. Uh, where we were in a filter bubble earlier in content-based filtering, we would be avoiding that over here, because you are actually looking across similar users, users who might have even transacted for a bit of a different genre over here. Maybe you are someone who is interested in action and thriller movies, but they are also interested in action and comedy movies. So we'll also start surfacing a bit of comedy movies to you also. So that's one advantage that we have over here. The drawback over here is unlike content-based filtering, where we are solely looking at you. here we are looking at your other similar users and movies and if we don't have interactions over there then you won't get those recommendations this is something known as a cold start problem and it's something that you would often find in recommendation systems for example when you boot up say uh, book my show first if you have never transacted on it the app will never know what kind of movies you like or what kind of events you are interested in but once you have slowly started interacting maybe you check out a uh, some comedy shows that are happening near uh, in mumbai or you check out some of concerts that are happening the app will identify that hey this user likes comedy shows or this user likes concerts and it will build up your user profile basis that user profile it can now start recommending to you so cold start is a serious problem with collaborative filtering so what usually happens in production is we use some combination of content based filtering and collaborative filtering to mitigate the drawbacks of both
So now, uh, once we have identified our candidates out of those billions of movies or shows that you have, you have narrowed it down to say hundreds and thousands. How do we surface or decide which movie should we show at the top? So here's where your scoring and re-ranking part comes. What's happening in scoring? In scoring, you're building what's called a learning to rank model. In a learning to rank model, you have three types of approaches. First is the point wise approach. Suppose you have 10 movies and all of them have a similar score. You want to consider, suppose for movie A, what's the likelihood that the user will buy or watch this movie? You are not concerned with the relevance of it among all the other nine movies that are there. You're solely focusing on the first movie. So that's your point wise approach. The second is your pair wise approach. You consider movies in pairs, a positive sample and a negative sample. A positive sample is something that the user would watch. A negative sample is something that the user is not interested in. And we want a model to get to recognize which of them the users would interact with first. So we are optimizing over here, given a pair, what would the user book for? Finally is a list wise approach. In a list wise approach, you are considering the entire uh, 10 movies at once instead of just looking at pairwise. Over here, each of them has their own advantages and disadvantages. For some cases, for example, if you have a vast data set, it could be infeasible running a listwise approach over there because it would be very computationally uh, hard over there. Rather, a pairwise approach is really reasonably acceptable for us. So based on your individual circumstances, we decide on which of these modeling aspects we should choose. Once you have decided which of these uh, movies should be ranked or how they should be ranked, the next stage is something that you want to consider that how they can be ranked. For some, for example, uh, if you have watched and book my show, sometimes you might see a promoted tag over there in some of your shows or movies. What happens over there? Here. Suppose we have some of our requirements that we uh, a client comes to us, we want to say that, hey, we want to promote this movie or we want to promote this show. So that's where the business decides that, no, we want to promote it and show it at the top so that the user sees this first. So that's what happens in re-ranking. You take some additional constraints into the picture and update your earlier scores. So re-ranking can also take into uh, consideration your position bias that happens. Usually when you're uh, interacting with any app, uh, if you have a widget of 10 movies, you won't wait to scroll to the end of the widget to identify which movie is relevant to you. Suppose if it's within the five movies, first five movies, great. Otherwise you are not, you don't have so much patience or time that you would scroll endlessly through all the movies. So usually you'll see a lot of interactions happening with the first few movies in the widget. We need to normalize that. We need to account that this position see a higher interaction just so that's what's called as accounting for positional bias over there similarly you want to also account for diversity if you as a user are interested in comedy shows and if we just keep showing you comedy shows after some time you might get bored you want to see something new you want to experience something different so that's where we incorporate diversity over here apart from optimizing from the immediate gain we also we also want to retain you for the longer term so, uh, for example, if you are interested in outdoor activities, if you are going for a lot of marathons and everything, we might also start showing you hiking over there because it's something related, something very similar. It's something that it's taking you outdoors, but it's something that you might be excited in. It's something happening nearby. So these are some factors that you need to consider when uh, you're re-ranking your or updating a model over there. So, uh, Right now we have looked at uh, in this session what recommendation systems are, how they work, why do we need recommendation systems and we have also looked at some of the common algorithms that goes under the hood. Uh, at this point, uh, if you guys have any questions about what's been over here, I'll be happy to take them on. I'm gonna build a recommendation now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's no question. Sir. Yeah. How 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 will we uh, be able to uh, indicate new recommendation system that we have built any website? For example, we have built any other website that you 
would seem that kind of work like book myself. Hmm. So how will we integrate that recommendation system in our website? Right? Just like uh, we will we uh, integrate uh, some database and all. Hmm. So how will we integrate that recommendation system? That's a good question. So, uh, how it works on production is once you have a recommendation service over there, how do you go about deploying it? Now, uh, there are primarily two ways uh, how recommendation systems work on production. One is something that it serves you uh, or does inferences dynamically. You'll often see your Netflix shows getting updated dynamically once you have interacted with it. What's happening is at each interaction, the client, you, the user, the device that you're using, it fires a request to the recommendation service. It fetches the recommendations and shows it to you. Another way that you can do is you can pre-compute this because running ML inferencing is a heavy job. It's a, a prediction model that's there and can take time. As a user, you won't wait for two to three seconds for that recommendation to come. You want something very fast. So what you can do is you can pre-compute the heavy tasks that are there. Suppose you know your list of users, you know that what they're likely to be interested in. You do it a day before, store those recommendations and then update your model periodically. So what happens is when the user comes on the app, you already have your results pre-computed. Now for that particular user, you get the user embeddings first. Next, you look at one, what are the recommendations for this user embedding? And then you fetch those, you get say the top 10 results that you want to show. So corresponding to this user embedding, these are the top 10 results that I have. So you show that to your uh, user. And if you want to make it more faster, you can even cache these results. So what happens, it saves you a hop over there. You don't want to go back to your data store every time. Rather, you can have it in your memory over there. You can have it in Redis or somewhere over there. You store the results. So that can make it faster. And you can also pre uh, you can also train your models periodically. You don't need to do it every time or every day that's happening because user interests don't change immediately. They take a long time to adapt. If you're trying a new genre or something, you develop a taste for it slowly. It won't happen immediately. So even if you do it after a week, two weeks or something, it's still fine. You won't get a very uh, immediate degradation in your ranking quality. At the same time, an important aspect when building uh, production ML systems is you keep monitoring for it. So monitoring is a very vital aspect of production ML systems. You want to see has the quality of your recommendations degraded? So you see that, hey, this is the, you will look at some of the earlier evaluation metrics, right? So those are something that you can use for monitoring your model also. You look at, hey, these are some of the evaluation metrics that were there. We saw that a week earlier they were different and there's been a drop in, say, Mumbai. You want to see what's happened in Mumbai. Why did it drop? Was the data quality hampered over there? Was it the users that had occurred? Was it for a particular demographic that we are looking at? Maybe it's just the young adults who are saying this. So that's how you deep dive over there. So I hope this answers your question. Uh, collaborative filtering are pretty fast. In fact, uh, if you are running on production, you can use or build a PySpark uh, model for it. PySpark comes with inbuilt uh, libraries like Spark MLlib, which offers you this functionality is out of the box. Uh, you might have uh, worked with Pandas, I think, when you're recent, uh, building your models locally. But what happens with Pandas is you can't scale it to billions of users. It has its limitations. So that's why when we are working with big data, we usually run Spark jobs for that. And uh, the advantage is with content-based filtering is uh, when you're dividing your metrics, there are various ways you can optimize it. You can use maybe stochastic gradient descent. I think some of you would have uh, learned about it during a LLM uh, session over there. Another aspect is you use simple optimization techniques over there, linear optimization techniques that are there. Stochastic gradient descent is computationally heavy and it can take a lot of resources. Whereas you can get uh, similar results with uh, lesser accuracy with other methods. So collaborative filtering is a very good start for us. With uh, content-based filtering, it's good if you have the metadata with you. It's heavily dependent on your item attributes. If you already have the item attributes in place, that's a very fast piece because you just have to do a simple lookup. You have got your user embeddings over here. You have already computed your item embeddings earlier. You just do a simple lookup and uh, show it to a user.
Uh, do we have any more questions? All right. Thank you for a really great session.